In a rangatira tēnā koutou, and in a tangata mai ina huwha tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. A warm welcome from the Brian Pico Chair in Ethical Leadership, the Wellington School of Business and Government, and from our partner Transparency International New Zealand. I'm so pleased to see you all here in Rutherford House and at one of the first in-house events since the COVID-19 outbreak. And I hope that you all enjoy this evening and will take some time to catch up with others uh, afterwards over refreshments and drinks. As you might have noticed, this event will be recorded and uh, there are also some photographs taken and we also uh, welcome the journalists in the room. The Brian Pika Chair in Ethical Leadership hopes to provide knowledge and insights based on evidence that can improve governance and business practices and help mitigate ethical risks uh, in our society. So we want to contribute towards uh, sustaining New Zealand's good ethical reputation. And one of the ways to do so is to facilitate frank and free discussions about important ethical issues. One of these important issues is our recovery from COVID-19 and the approach we will take. The COVID-19 outbreak has changed our world in unprecedented ways, and the pandemic has placed extraordinary demands on leaders in government and business and in the wider community. While many countries are now facing a second wave of the virus, New Zealand is among the first in a position to move from dealing with the crisis to navigating our recovery. This will undoubtedly be a daunting challenge, and ethical leadership is needed as the moral compass for the many difficult trade-offs and choices to be made, and to protect our number one ethical reputation in the world that is essential for economic recovery in New Zealand. We are fortunate to have so many leaders with strong ethical values and practices who act with integrity within the public service, private sector, and our communities. And I believe that New Zealand has the opportunity to lead the world in setting a good example. We certainly cannot be afford to be complacent, because in times of crisis, there are far greater risks for integrity violations to arise, in terms of the incentives, the opportunities, and rationalizations of wrongdoing. So now, more than ever, integrity and transparency need to be high on the agenda. We will hear from our five political candidates, Honorable Andrew Little, Honorable James Shaw, Jessica Hammond, Fletcher Tabutoy, and David Patterson, how they see their ethical leadership role and how they reflect on business and political integrity during the recovery from the COVID crisis. When they will be interviewed by Ian Fraser, who will ask a few tough questions. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. I'm also honored now to introduce to you Tanitha Paul as our MC. Tanitha was first elected to council in 2019 and is one of the three Bukihino Lambton Ward councillors for the 2019-2022 Triennium. She brings a strong youth voice to the council table, having previously been the first Vahine Maori president of the Victoria University of Wellington Students Association. During her time with FUSA, she worked alongside a number of community organizations on issues such as renting, city safety, and mental health. Tamata stood for election as an independent candidate and campaigned on issues such as Zero Waste Wellington, connecting communities and an aspiration for a living wage city, and the importance of prioritizing future-facing leadership, which puts the needs of the next generation front and center of decision-making. Tamata descends from Na Nati Awa and Waikato Tanui, and her hometown is Tokoroa. These days, though, she's a proud resident of Arrow Valley. Thank you, and Tamitha, over to you.
O tēnā tātou, um, no mā haru mai ki te Heringa Waka a Victoria University of Wellington. Um, hui hui mai nei i tō tātou nei whare. Um, ai. Um, welcome, kia ora everyone, um, and welcome to tonight's event. And I have the privilege of hosting you all alongside my pal Ian, and tonight we are talking about transparency, uh, integrity, accountability, and all of those really important um, values that we pride ourselves on as being a fair little country uh, out here in the Pacific. So um, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview, and I will just also add that if you do need to use the bathrooms, they're just straight out the store and on either sides of the lift if you need those. Um, and they are accessible uh, to anybody in a wheelchair. Um, awesome. So basically, we'll crack right into it. Um, so tonight, we, kia ora, welcome to all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, they will have two and a half minutes uh, to give their pitch uh, on those topics that I just talked about before. And then we have four specialised questions uh, for them as well, which will be delivered by Ian. And then following that, we will take some questions and answers from the floor. We have some that have already come in today, so thank you to um, those who have sent those in. But we will also take some from the floor if there's uh, time for that. That as well. So I'm going to start by introducing our candidates for the evening who will then uh, give us a two and a half minute pitch about their party's uh, positions on um, those values of transparency and integrity. And then I'm going to pass it over to Ian. So I'm going to start um, off by introducing uh, the Honourable Andrew Little. So uh, Andrew Little is a current Member of Parliament, having studied here at uh, Victoria University of Wellington, completing a Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts. Andrew became a lawyer with the Engineers Union before being appointed the Engineering, Printing and Manufacturing Union National Secretary. Andrew has divided his, uh, devoted his life to advocating for New Zealanders entering Parliament in 2011 with a mission to leave behind a better country. Today, his ministerial portfolios include justice, workplace relations and safety, Treaty of Waitangi negotiations and the Government Communications Security Bureau. And also, Andrew was born in New Plymouth but calls uh, Te Whanganui Atara or Wellington his home. So kia ora, Andrew. And Suzanne, will you be uh, timing? Awesome. Cool. If you could just give Andrew a signal when his uh, time is almost up. Is can you hear me? Can, yeah. is this good? This is good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Kia uh, ora, Good evening. Thank you, um, Timothy, and good evening, Ian, and my colleagues. Um, and good evening to all of you, too. Uh, look, a couple of things I just want to cover off. First of all is, uh, in a sense, the decision-making that took us through the COVID-19 pandemic and New Zealand's response to it. And then secondly, uh, the challenges that uh, remain as we're now kind of uh, seek to get out of it. Uh, those challenges are not just economic, they are social as well. Um, the significance of talking about how we made decisions, the basis on which we made decisions, is about what sets us up for uh, that, that future and our recovery, uh, both social and economic. It was very clear very early in the year that uh, this challenge was on us. I remember well remember the first uh, emergency cabinet meeting that was called on a Saturday evening, 1st of February, uh, where when countries were considering closing their borders, at least in part, to other countries, and we had to start making some decisions along that line. Right from then, and every decision that uh, the government of the day made was based on the science, the medical advice that we received. And it was important that we got the balance of making sure we were informed, scientifically and medically informed, and that the political considerations that we were taking into account weren't ones that were about kind of setting ourselves off against each other, but about the judgments about what, you know, how, how we are effective, how we're going to communicate and how we bring people with us. Um, and that was the basis on which we made decisions and, uh, and got our way through. Uh, to the point we are today, where, like many other countries, not only haven't been afflicted with it, but afflicted with it more than uh, more than once. Um, but we have, in terms of where we're at, uh, casualties, fatalities, impact on the economy, we are way ahead of pretty much every other country in the world. Um, what that has enabled us to do, what one of the effects of that is that it has uh, considerably enhanced New Zealand's reputation abroad. That will help us in terms of our economic and social recovery. We already know from some ex exporters they're telling us that there is now a premium attached particularly to our food and beverage exports because we are seen as a, a safe country and a healthy country from which 
those products originate. Where I also seen as a safe country in which to invest because of the, the quality of the leadership that we've experienced. Is it a warning or an end? That's the end. Uh, <laughs> but you get the general drift, and I'll have more to say throughout the evening. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so that's the sound to look out for. Um, so now we're going to go to the other side of the room, uh, to the Honourable James Shaw. So James is also a current Member of Parliament, and prior to becoming an MP, James had a successful career in management consulting, primarily in London. James worked with large multinational companies across Europe and around the world, helping them develop more sustainable business practices. Completing his undergraduate at Victoria University of Wellington, he completed his Master's in Sustainability and Business Leadership at the University of Bath School of of management. James was appointed Green Party co-leader on May 30th, 2015, after being elected to Parliament as a List MP in 2014. And then in 2017, James was appointed Minister for Climate Change, Minister of Statistics and Associate Minister of Finance. James, kia ora. Good evening. So transparency and accountability have been uh, values that the Green Party has championed um, both before we got into Parliament uh, and in the 20 years that we were in Parliament and in opposition and again once we uh, made the transition to being a party of government just in this last term since 2017. Uh, back in the 2000s uh, we unilaterally made the decision to um, publish our MPs expenses um, and that led to a reform of uh, the whole system. So now all MPs' expenses are, um, are uh, published just as a matter of course. Um, during this time in government, um, we made the decision to publish our minister's diaries, uh, and within a few months that became the standard minister, of course, that our, uh, our full diaries are published um, after you know, um, a, a period of time has passed. Uh, and um, we, uh, we actually started off by giving our Patsy questions uh, to the opposition um, until they told us that they didn't want them anymore, uh, because um, and and so we ended up taking them uh, taking them back because we felt that as a party of government that actually one of the roles of accountability should be that it should be the the opposition should be taking question time to ask those questions rather than the government asking Patsy questions uh, of themselves. Um, now, our belief is that that helps to uh, build a more transparent, more robust democratic system. There are other things that we would like to see uh, Parliament introduce and, and, and government introduce uh, in the future as well. But we think it's more important um, that we have a culture in the country that is founded on those principles. And actually, we are very lucky uh, in New Zealand. I, and I do say lucky, actually, given uh, what the counterfactual is around the world. Um, because it is actually important uh, to our economy um, and to our society as well. The example that I would use would be say, well, who would you like to program your security software? A New Zealand company or a Russian company? Right? And so, and I say this with all due respect to any Russians in the room, um, but uh, it, it has a huge impact um, the, whether or not that company, you know, in either case, uh, has any form of malpractice, the reputation uh, of a country in terms of its transparency and its openness and its integrity makes a huge difference in terms of the dealings that we have um, with the rest of the world. So when I talk about the things that we would like to do in government, for us that is actually about bolstering not just our democratic system but our country as a whole. Thank you. Uh, next up, we are going to Fletcher Tabuto. So, Fletcher Tabuto is the Deputy Leader of the New Zealand First Party. Uh, he serves as the Parliamentary Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Disarmament and Arms Control, and Regional Economic Development. In this current parliamentary term, Mr Tabuto has held a range of spokesperson roles, including Associate Finance, Commerce, Revenue, Trade, Tourism and Energy. Fletcher was also the Deputy Chair of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee, and Mr Tabuto has been a member of New Zealand First since the party's inception in 1993 and joined Parliament in 2014. Uh, Fletcher was a lecturer in economics and business and has had previous experience as a business consultant as well as a as 10 years as a New Zealand business mentor. And finally, Fletcher is from Rotorua and is of Ngāti Ngāraranui, Ngāti Rangi Wewehe and Ngāti Whakaue descent. Kia ora, Fletcher. <laughs> 
Kia ora. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, can I simply start off by uh, thank you, um, thanking you all uh, for being here tonight. Really, all I wanted to say by way of introduction was to have the conversation around uh, accountability, ethical government, ethical business, transparency and accountability. And the reason I say that is because it's something that we can't let slip, that we can't take for granted in this modern day and age. And unfortunately, uh, there are examples of a standing president contesting, um, already contesting the grounds of an election outcome coming up in terms of respecting the result. And that, I know it puts uh, a huge amount of fear into me. And I know it will put a huge amount of fear into the people around the world. And so I, as the Minister, uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, I've travelled the world, and my motivation on return has always to come back and find a crowd to be able to say, we don't know how lucky we are. But this room probably does know how lucky we are. Um, and it's incredible in terms of... What the Minister of Foreign Affairs often says, the rest of the world's a hellhole, and we we don't know how lucky we are in New Zealand. And it is because of the democracy we uphold, the integrity with which we operate, the accountability and the system in which our politicians and businesses operate, knowing that there's an accountability system. And I passionately stand here in front of you saying we must defend that, we must not take it for granted, and we must continue to ensure that it evolves. And seeing as I have a little bit of time left, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, the Minister here in terms of our COVID response uh, uh, with uh, New Zealand First Ministers in the um, Cabinet room making these incredibly difficult calls on how to respond to COVID. Um, I wasn't in the room, so I'm allowed to say it was a masterclass, and it, um, it means that we're able to congregate here tonight and have this discussion amongst ourselves and, and um, do so knowing that we can go home well and uh, uh, in, in good sound mind, hopefully. So, look, thank you so much for being here. I look forward to answering your questions and... Uh, the questions from the audience. Kia ora, koutou. I should have said, should have said, should have said Bulavanaka, Fijian language week. Thank you. Uh, and now we're going to go on to Jessica Hammond. So Jessica is uh, the Opportunity Party's candidate for Ohario uh, here in Wellington, uh, where she is standing for the second time. She has been a public servant for 16 years, advising many ministers across several government departments. She has a master's in philosophy, specialising in applied ethics. Jessica is passionate about strong public institutions and believes we have a responsibility to those who can't vote. So that's children, future generations and other species that have a stake in this country. And just wanted to say thank you for being the only woman on this panel tonight as well. Kia ora, Jessica. Floor is yours. Thanks, Tamitha. Um, yeah, kia ora tato. So, uh, yeah, I'm very proud to be um, the Opportunities Party candidate for Ohariu for the second time and, um, you know, to be among this exalted panel. Um, so thank you for, <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, look, um, at, at, top, we uh, um, really uh, believe that strong institutions make a, make a strong country and um, we think that, it, you know, Democracy is a fragile, a fragile thing, and you know we, we look at what happens in the United States with with, uh, with the president. We're not immune to any of these things, and um, organisations like Transparency International um, help to underline the importance of these strong institutions to protecting our democracy, which protects our way of life. So I too would like to congratulate the government on um, following the advice uh, of experts and um, keeping us in a really good um, position when it comes to COVID, but I would like to ask them why they ignore the evidence on just about everything else. So they are very good, and this does not just apply to Labour, this applies to you know every government that I've seen for the last 30 years. Um, for example, ignoring three tax working groups, ignoring the Welfare Expert Advisory Group, ignoring the um, Water Science um, uh, te Technical Group, ignoring the uh, advice on uh, re reforming MMP of the Electoral Commission, just to name a few. So that is a thing that makes TOP different, is that we, we believe that not just 
COVID is not the only crisis that kills. The housing crisis kills, poverty kills, climate change kills. And we can use expertise to save lives and make, the, make New Zealand a better place. So that is what TOP stands for and that is what I stand for. Looking into the long term, uh, looking to uh, not just the the electoral term, uh, looking after people who can't vote, protecting our institutions, following the evidence. Plus, everything we promise, unlike some parties up here, um, is is fully costed because we think that it's important then we, that when politicians make promises, they are able to deliver on them. Every time a politician fudges an answer, makes a promise they can't, uh, can't keep, uh, takes money that undermines at least the appearance of um, transparency and democracy, this weakens our institutions and weakens our, as uh, some of these gentlemen have pointed out, weakens our uh, reputation overseas also. Kia ora. Awesome, thank you. And on to our final candidate for the evening, uh, welcome David Patterson. So David Patterson is the National Party's candidate for Rongotai, which is also here in Wellington. Uh, he is an alumni of Victoria University of Wellington, uh, completing a Bachelor of Law with Honours and a Bachelor of Commerce and Administration. David went on to complete his Master's in Law at Harvard University. David has been a partner in the law firm Chapman Tripp and one of New Zealand's leading commercial and tax lawyers for the last 30 years. In addition to his legal career, David is the chair for the Dingle Foundation, Wellington and Wellington Tennis, as well as former chair of Fulbright New Zealand and Tennis New Zealand. David, kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. And thank you all for the great work you do in supporting Transparency International and the work that they do. Now, I was told that I had a little moment for a pitch and that as long as I made some tangential reference to transparency, I'd be OK. So I'm going to be transparent about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, I'm being transparent about what we're now facing in this economy. With a negative 12.2% quarter, New Zealand is in recession. 170,000 more people will be unemployed than in March over the course of the next year. That increases more than three times my electorate in Rongatai. That's 170,000 families, real people, real people who don't have jobs and real families that don't have incomes. Uh, and we've got a lot worse than that in the sense that a lot of people also have quite, that are not in that 170,000 also have quite a significant reduction in their hours of work. So National will produce more jobs by a temporary $3,000 tax cut uh, for middle income earners. It'll bring forward core infrastructure. It'll secure the border. It'll encourage private sector businesses to rebuild. And it'll do, it's that private sector that's going to create the new jobs that we need. As we dip into recession and as we're starting to go down that track and as we turn, we need settings that are ready and there that are going to encourage those jobs to come back up. And it's the private sector that, by and large, are going to do that. And so national settings broadly are, are in that space, a $10,000 grant for businesses to take on each new employee, 30000 in capital to start a new business where a person has lost their job, Faster tax depreciation when you make new planned investment, reskilling and retraining and new apprenticeships, repealing the RMA, more flexible labour laws, and doubling the NZ tech sector by 2030. For private businesses and for the jobs that they create, this is a recipe for hope, the type of hope that Bishop Tutu refers to when he says, hope is being able to see light when all, you, all around you is darkness. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, candidates, for um, your two-and-a-half-minute pitch, and thank you for sticking to time. So now we're going to go on to the part of our evening where we're going to ask some more detailed and technical questions about those values that have come up already. Um, so I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Ian. So uh, most of you here will know uh, Ian and his work that he's done over the years. Uh, Ian Fraser was one of this country's preeminent current affairs interviewers and presenters for more than 20 years. 
As Chief Executive and New Zealand Commissioner General, he was the driving force behind New Zealand's presence at Expo 88 in Brisbane and Expo 92 in Seville. Between 1998 and 2002, he was Chief Executive of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, and in April 2002, he moved from that position to the role of Chief Executive of Television New Zealand, a position he held until the end of 2005. Since then, he has been a personal advisor and media coach to some of the leading figures in New Zealand's business, political and sports communities. Take it away, Ian. Thanks, Tamatha. Uh, kia ora tata. Uh, the set may look a bit like ten nights in a bar room, <laughs> but this, um, this isn't that kind of debate. Uh, it reminds me actually a lot of the kind of debate that we used to do back in the olden days when I chaired more than my fair share of pre-election debates and everything was rigidly worked to the stopwatch and time was assigned before the debate began and if you didn't keep to the timing you got your toes cut off. And you got some bizarre situations. For example, the situation where the National Party representative would have four minutes. You didn't use your time. Um, four minutes to um, give a, a pitch on the basis of the fact that that was the kind of time that was justified on the basis of the pre-election public opinion polls. Labour would almost invariably have the same amount of time and if you were poor Bruce Beetham from the Social Credit Party I had time to ask a question, but he didn't have time to answer it. <laughs> so, so what we're doing here, we're not, we're not debating. And actually, given um, the history of debates over the last couple of weeks, particularly the American inflected one, that's probably a relief. What I'm going to be doing is I'm putting... Um, four substantial questions, one at a time, to um, each of the five uh, party representatives. And then, with luck, provided Suzanne leaves me alone, there'll be an opportunity to do a little bit of follow-up. We don't have long for each of the answers, so if we don't cover the thing that particularly interests you, you get an opportunity to follow up in a rather more competent form than I've managed at the end of the debate. There's ample time to do that. So, first question. Uh, and I'll try to make sure that um, we mix up the order in which they answer the questions as we go through. We are in the middle of a pandemic and no one needs to be reminded of the extent to which the world has changed. So starting with you, Andrew, how do you see COVID-19 and our response to it impacting on matters like transparency and accountability, protective disclosure, procurement and conflicts of interest? I think um, by way of contrast, uh, in, in terms of dealing with COVID-19, it was an emergency situation. Decisions had to be taken rapidly, uh, and indeed the whole way Parliament operated had to change. But in doing that, we also had to make sure there were appropriate safeguards and accountability measures, which is why we set up the, um, the COVID response uh, select committee, special select committee, chaired by the then leader of the opposition, Simon Bridges, uh, with a, with a, and in fact dominated by uh, members of the opposition. But in terms of the, res 
you know, the response since, I think the critical thing is that we don't get used to that mode of operating, we don't get used to crisis mode, because that can be used as, a, as an excuse or a defence for doing a lot of things. I know that in the meantime, we have looked at the Protected Disclosures Act, and we now have a, uh, an amending piece of legislation, um, not so much informed by what came out of COVID-19, but actually more out of the, the Minister of Transport, Joan Harrison, uh, uh, situation that arose a few years ago ensuring that whistleblowers can have a direct place to go, not inside the organisation, but outside it. In terms of accountability, making sure that those institutions are in place for proper and strong oversight of public organisations. Uh, we've built up a good culture around that. We, there's still more that we can do. Has the pandemic raised the corruption threat level in New Zealand, do you think? Whenever there is expedited decision making, there's always a risk that things will fall through the cracks. There's been no significant sums of money appropriated and budgeted uh, for the response. We've left aside $14 billion for future responses such as the wage subsidy, although at least one political party has promised that that could be used to fund tax cuts. We know that the way that the wage subsidy was administered uh, meant some people took it, some organisations took it, who probably didn't need it. Some of those have paid it back. Others are awaiting their audit and no doubt will be told to pay it back. There is always that risk, but then you have to trade off the need for expedition and getting money into organisations who need it to sustain their workforce as opposed to uh, what is needed for kind of the pure forms of accountability. James, what do we need to be doing to make sure that hard and fast uh, is also transparent and accountable? I mean, do you see, do you see a, uh, an increase in the threat level to New Zealand of various forms of corruption as a result of this pandemic? Yes, I do. Um, I think... Uh um, I, look, I, I just, I, I just, all I'm going to do really is echo what Andrew has just said, which is that um, when you're dealing with an existential crisis, um, you move very, very quickly, and we did, and um, uh, quality decision-making suffers as a result of that, of that speed. Um, and so I would, I would actually say rather than corruption, there's inefficiency. Right, so there was, um, a, you know, there'd be a lot of wastage at the margins that you would hope not to have in a business as usual scenario. Though three years in government tells me that there's a reasonable amount of wastage in a business as usual scenario as well, um, and and you just have to accept the fact that there there will be that. Um, I think the important thing is that once you kind of through the crisis stage, that you go back and review all of the decisions that were made during uh, during that period of time. I I happen to grant in his wisdom, gave me the delegation of um, regulatory quality uh, roughly a month before we suspended the need for uh, regulatory impact statements. Um, uh, so I didn't have much to do for a while. Um, but what I would like to do is go back and audit and apply regulatory impact statements to all of the decisions that were made during that period of time when we weren't requiring them. And we simply were moving too fast to be able to have those. So anybody who's had any time in the public service will know the amount of time do it takes to do those things. Do you think now for ramping up the regulatory framework and the legislative framework in order to confront this new crisis? You may answer. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, go. Well, no, I, I, I do. I, I just think, um, I guess the important thing is to, is just to be really straight about the decisions that were made, you know, and to go, look, it was a crisis. We did make all of these decisions in a hurry uh, with, um, frankly, in most cases, scant or no real data. Um, and, and, you know, there was a, a reasonable level of kind of gut decision making to deal with that crisis. And I think the vast majority of people, my experience, go, yeah, we, like we get it. It was a major crisis. The important thing is to kind of go back and try and clean that up afterwards. Um, and we will no doubt uh, discover decisions that were made erroneously or, um, you know, I would just say erroneously, uh, or, or maybe the decision wasn't erroneous, but there would be flow and effects in, and consequences where, where there would be inefficiency and wastage. And I, th I then think you just need to kind of manage that, manage that back. Um, and I, and at, at one level, I think that that's fine. I, I, d I do think that I, I actually, the thing that worries me more in terms of corruption is what happens when, you know, you set up a system and, and you then allow a particular way of operating to sort of take hold. Um, and uh, given that we are basically flooding liquidity into the economy to keep it going, 
um, it would be very easy to flip from a, a very transparent and, and open economy to one which is much more built around vested interests with political influence, as you see in the United States. Um, and uh, and that, really, that really does worry me. Fletcher, we'll come to you. Is, is there any evidence that you've seen, that you're aware of, that the COVID crisis has led to a fall in integrity standards? I'm an undersecretary, so I, I'm part of the executive, but not actually in cabinet and not part of the decision-making process. So my only first-hand experience um, has been with the um, decision-making process around the Provincial Growth Fund, for example, where that's uh, decisions for ministers, plural, and then cabinet. And then the um, Strategic Tourism Assets Program, which was a, a very rapid deployment of um, funds to help tourism operators to cope with the uncertainty and the loss of income, even that was a, um, a, a bringing together of ministers rather than Minister Davis making the decision by himself. And then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and then they also took external advice from industry bodies and experts. So I actually agree with James in that if I have any concerns, it's not about corruption, it's about a sensible use of funds given the limited of knowledge and the time constraints that we had. And can I just finish on the one point? I was on the uh, pandemic, the COVID response select committee, um, and it, my understanding is that was unique in, in the rest of the world, uh, where the government said, uh, uh, with consultation with the opposition, uh, we need this form of accountability uh, in front of us and to give a new select committee the chair to the opposition leader and then the right to call anyone forward. We actually, um, Andrew might be able to explain the, uh, the um, definitions better, but essentially we gave them slightly more power than a standard select committee to make sure that people turned up and were accountable. So it gave... Um, a huge sense of accountability in terms of New Zealanders watching every day. And the feedback was that New Zealanders were incredibly pleased that this had been the process. David, um, to you, the, the, there's always, I think, in the kind of situation that we have been in and that we're still facing, that um, we let the crisis become a kind of veil for the corrupt. Do you see any evidence that this has been happening? I'm not sure about corrupt. Um, I mean, I'd I probably start by saying, look, the government, to my view, has done a really good job of the lockdown. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, but here we go. Um, <laughs> and um, I guess the question there, what, we, what National would see, and remember, I'm not in the fray, I'm a new candidate, so I'm watching it from the trenches, sidelines, as you may, as, as the rest of us. But what you do see, I think, is a lot lower levels of transparency right through this than what you would expect, frankly. And maybe that's partly the emergency, but it is critical that it's not the norm. And I do think, and I mean, you can, we can go through examples of that. I've got some that I wrote down. You know, medical advice is a regards moving between levels, not particularly transparent as to what it is, but we've got our decision. The extent to which processes claim to be in place are actually in place, not particularly transparent on some of that. So, so how would There's you change... a whole change, range of those things. How would you change yeah. systems to cope with that? Well, I think if, you've, if you're do, dealing with that and you've got Parliament shut down and you're in an emergency environment, then that's a separate thing. What we're talking about now going forward is how does it look? And what we are talking about now is monumental amounts of debt, the likes we've never seen, and we're talking about monumental amounts of industry sector support, the likes we've never seen, uh, and, what I th and we're talking about monumental amounts of investment in infrastructure, the likes of which we've never seen. And so we do need to make sure that when the private sector comes to the public trough, we get real transparency out there on all of that. That is absolutely critical because I've worked for the private sector for 30 years of my life. 
I know that if you give them the opportunity to take advantage, then by and large they will take advantage. Uh, and that is why we need the level of, pre uh, of uh, uh, transparency at a heightened awareness right here and right now for these next year or so. Mighty. Jessica, I'm happy for you to answer the general question first, but just to kind of point it from what David was saying, you know, infrastructure spending is shaping up as perhaps the major driver of the economic recovery, and we are talking vast sums of taxpayer dollars. Are our processes for making infrastructure decisions open and transparent enough as things stand? I am so pleased you asked me that question because this is one of the biggest bugbears I have. Um, as a public servant, I worked in transport infrastructure funding um, as my, as, you know, as, as a policy advisor. And um, if I may just digress very, very briefly, this is super relevant. In, you know, pre the uh, 90s, um, you know, the, the uh, process for funding infrastructure was completely political and you can, uh, you know, buy votes wherever you like or, you know, punish the people you don't like, buy votes from the people you do like. And politicians made a very responsible and very rare decision that they were not able to be trusted with that money. So they made those infrastructure funding decisions politically independent. Now, ever since then, they have been eroding it. Back when I was working at the Ministry of Transport, if someone said, we want this road or this train station, um, the minister, we would, we would write letters from the minister saying the transport infrastructure funding decisions are a, a neutral, uh, politically neutral uh, responsibility of the, uh, as was then, Transfund Board. And they like being able to say that because then they can, you know, stop doing the things they don't want to do. But they also want to be able to buy the votes. So they have been eroding this over time. National and Labor have both been eroding this over time in, in various ways. So now with the Crown contributions and with the, the debt funding, I don't, I wouldn't call it corruption, but it's opportunism. And the line between opportunism and corruption can be very fine sometimes. So I think we need to depoliticize infrastructure funding. They were right. Politicians can't be trusted with our children and grandchildren's money when it comes to infrastructure. Thank you for that. We'll move on. Um, there's, there's strong evidence that the public sector has become a great deal more focused on preventing corruption over the past, I don't know, five, six, seven years. The same can't necessarily be said from the evidence that I've seen for the private sector. And transparency's assessment shows few, if any, signs of improvement in businesses' complacency about its conduct and culture over the same period. So we're getting a two-step kind of improvement. Now we've got um, an economic recovery from COVID to engineer. So if anything, it gets more complex and it gets more challenging from here on in. As we move into recovery mode, what should we be doing to ensure that business integrity private sector integrity is strengthened. Um, David, I'm going to start with you. I took the question to be a bit about... I'm going to take it on a question of um, foreign corrupt corruption and some of the illegalities we have in that area. Um, and the question is, are, are they alert... Uh, and so I've taken the, the um, course of talking to one of my friends in one of the top companies in New Zealand, major exporter, uh, who deals with this. And what is very clear to me from talking to him, he knows exactly that he's not able to go out there and bribe officials in a foreign country. Absolutely exactly. He knows that if he does that, he's not only committing a crime, he will also lose his job. He does get training about it because Kiwis are a bit naive. So I'll give you an example of something that happens. You go out, you turn up, you're playing 
uh, golf in a foreign country with a with a uh, person who's an official of that country, and that you arrive at the tee, and the official asks for a thousand dollars per hole on the golf match, and the intent is not that you win any holes. <laughs> Uh, so they do, in fact, go and get training as to the t styles of corruption that they are likely to face in their daily jobs. And that's, this may be an outlier. It, it may be an outlier, but I do think that they, there is quite a high degree of awareness, and I'd be surprised given that their criminal offences, if for any country that's dealing internationally, there was not a high level of focus on this at a board governance level. Your, your friend, though, is able, presumably, to make what we call facilitation payments. Well, legally entitled, should he be? Well, if he, well, I don't. I did, we didn't get into the details of it. What he can't do, if you're, if what we're saying, because I don't think you can do that, for example, under U.S. law. I think that's a more that may be a more robust regime than than than, than we are operating in, uh, and I don't. I think the answer to that is we shouldn't be doing anything that actually em embraces corruption. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we've got we've got tens of billions of dollars of public money um, being spent, as I said, on the pandemic. What should we be doing that um, we're not doing right now to make sure that with regard to funding being funneled in the direction of the private sector, uh, that that money is spent properly and with integrity? Fletcher. To be honest, I'm, uh, I have to say I'm not too sure. Um, in, in Parliament, in our decision-making process, uh, there's a huge, huge uh, system of accountability in terms of um, no one minister making a decision on procurement. You take the infrastructure, infrastructure fund itself, um, or even provincial growth fund spending on roading, for example, one of the greatest frustrations is on the provincial ground growth fund investment in roading, is that NZTA did come back and say, uh, yeah, we'll do that, but it's on our list and we'll just do it when, um, we, when it, we get to it on our list. Um, and it was incredibly um, frustrating, but that um, all of the ministers, the red ministers, kind of, you know, sighed in frustration and moved on to the next uh, challenge. Uh, the infrastructure fund is another example of um, the infrastructure minister, the state-owned minister, uh, uh, the finance minister, and others who have to be in the room. And actually, if you look at the frustration of the corporate world at the moment, is that it's taken so long to triage down and to justify and to make those arguments in terms of commercial investment into infrastructure. So that is my actual impression and understanding. Uh, not that money's um, flying out the window. Um, for example, example, the Provincial Growth Fund has only invested um, about 1.2 billion of its t total 3 billion, um, and that's about businesses meeting milestones. No one was throwing money out, out the window at the time or, you know, the accusations that were being thrown around regarding the Provincial Growth Fund. That was a very robust commercial process, for example. James, I mentioned facilitation payments, which I believe are legal under our law. Um, what about the what about the beneficial ownership of companies? Is that something that sh that needs to be more transparent, more open? It is. It's, it is actually something that we've moved on uh, in this last term. Um, to uh, start to provide some transparency and to look through companies and trusts and so on. And, and um, one of the, you know, at, at the time, back in, when was it, 2015, 2016, when the Panama Papers came out, uh, you know, we had something like, I'm trying to remember, 15,000 um, uh, trusts and companies uh, operating in, in New Zealand. And 
you know, people are sort of saying, oh, well, the vast majority of these won't be used for corrupt practices and, and so on, but there'll be a tiny portion that are. Um, and so we said, okay, well, we'll change the law then. And they said, well, you don't need to do that because most of them aren't being used for corrupt practices. And we said, well, in that case, it won't matter if we do. And so we did. And then um, two weeks later, there were eight left. Um, so uh, so it's, it's clear that, you know, that, you know, sunlight is the best d- disinfectant then. Um, I, so I th- but I think that there's probably more work to do there, and that would also help with our tax system, uh, where uh, you know you you see some avoidance still. C- can I just come back to this thing about um, politicians making decisions about infrastructure spending? I have some recent experience of this, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know it's funny. Uh, there's it's, there are layers of irony um, here because of course I'm the only minister that got a thoroughly good kicking for uh, an erroneous decision. Um, made under uh, pressure and speed. Um, And at the time, uh, I said, I don't think that ministers should be making these decisions. Actually, we actually should have an infrastructure bank, which I know that the National Party are promoting at the moment. Um, Of course, we don't have time when you're dealing with that sort of need to inject that amount of uh, liquidity into the economy in such a short period of time to set one up. Um, But I have also set one up um, in the last term of Parliament in the Green Infrastructure Fund, Um, and so the Green Investment um, Finance Limited. And that started with the principle that that politicians should not be making those decisions, and so we set it up at arm's length from ministers, and I have no prior knowledge of anything that they're going to invest in. uh, until they, about 24 hours in advance, they give us a notice and say, well, we've, you know, we've made the following investment decision and so on. And I actually think that should be the model for, like, particularly now, because that was only $100 million, green investment finance. It was a small minimum viable proposition. We were sort of experimenting with something. But if you're about to spend the kind of money that we're looking at spending over the course of the next term of parliament, then I would say that you need an institution that can do that. There are, and I also think an infrastructure bank would be able to move faster than the kind of contestable funds uh, that the various public service agencies um, have had. And it is a frustration of ministers that we've made some enormous uh, appropriations and then they've basically sat in the bank um, because the agencies haven't been able to uh, then deploy that. Um, but I think a, a sort of a, uh, you know, an arm's length institution. Um, with, you know, staffed by real professionals who are making decisions on a benefit-cost ratio basis within very clear guidance that has been set by ministers in terms of what those criteria are, would both be able to um, make uh, better decisions where there was less concern about what it might do to voting patterns and um, be able to uh, deploy capital faster than uh, we've been able to. Thanks, Jessica. Just... <clears throat> taking up um, James's point about the fact that we're moving into recovery. And if anything, uh, things may end up going harder and faster um, from this point. So if you had to identify the one biggest thing from your perspective that we should be doing to ensure that we're taking this opportunity to strengthen business integrity, what would it be? To strengthen business integrity? Oh, I guess the only thing I could have any real insight into is, 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 um, is procurement, so government procurement um, of, of business. I, I'm not going to um, pretend to have the answers on business integrity in general, but... Um, you know, we've all talked about the sort of um, speed, transparency, um, tra- trade-off, but and, and things move slowly in the public service for a reason. You know, Shane Jones was very hard on public servants over the provincial growth fund, but you know, I have run funds in the in the public service, and you can either do things um, transparently or you can do them quickly. You don't you don't get to do both. Um, but when it comes to procurement, I don't know, I take a pretty hard line on this. I know um, we want procurement to solve all of our problems. So we want to, you know, to be to be funding indigenous businesses and, and women's businesses and sustainable businesses and and um, 
the ones that are going to pay on time, and you know, there is there is a massive list, but. Actually, when you are taking massive amounts of money from government, then you need to be able to report on it. And if you're if you're not going to, then you shouldn't be taking the money. The other thing we we should be doing, which we don't do enough of. I mean, I, I James, I, I like the intention of going back and doing regulatory impact statements, but we don't evaluate in the public service. It just it just almost never happens. So so we're constantly there's this pressure, and I think the three year parliamentary term. Sorry, I'm I'm going a bit all over the place, but the three year parliamentary term as part of this. There's this pressure to constantly go quickly and to make decisions with inadequate evidence, and then we don't go back afterwards and see whether the thing we were funding worked. Ian, I know you're about to ask a question of Andrew, and he hasn't had a lot of airtime. But can I jump in on this question about the private sector? Transparency? I think what we'll do is we'll leave that, if we may, until the end. I'm really anxious that um, everybody gathered here has an opportunity to trawl you guys. <laughs> Andrew, um, we know that National has promised into a considerable amount of public applause to double the serious fraud officers' budget to $25 million a year. How important... I mean, this is looking at the sort of deterrence stroke coercion side of the thing. How important would that be in reinforcing integrity and um, dealing to corruption? I'm going to try and weave together three things. First, an answer to that question, then an answer to some of the other questions. But on that, actually, I, I don't disagree with... Uh, what the National Party is proposing to do, I think the more important part of their proposal is to extend the remit of the Serious Fraud Office, uh, and, and actually not to call it a Serious Fraud Office, but to give it a broader anti-corruption mandate. And it's something I personally believed in, um, and indeed Stuart Nash and I have started some work on that, um, and I think that is an area that we need to go. The extent to which it, 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 it affects the budget, I mean, let's, you know, let's see what happens there. Um, I think that is important because I think and when it comes to the private sector and business, I think one of the big challenges we have is for those interacting with private businesses is, is just the, the means or the ability to challenge uh, decisions uh, or the impact of decisions on people who, who don't have the means to do so. There's an access to justice issue here. So um, shareholders or customers who are ripped off by a business, unless they are well backed and whether they've got litigation funders or others, I uh, find it de very difficult to get accountability, at least you know, through the legal system. I want to comment on just something else slightly tangentially, but the, the interplay between politics and uh, so-called rational decision-making about infrastructure. The reality is it is totally legitimate for politicians and political parties to say, we think this is an answer to an infrastructure problem, and it is to do this. It is to build seven roads of national significance. It is to build a city rail um, link. It is to build uh, light rail down Dominion Road and out to the airport. That is a totally legitimate thing for the political process to put up and to get a response from the electorate on, and if the electorate says yes, to proceed with that. I don't accept that politicians should be driven to be technocrats when it comes to these sorts of things. I think the bigger problem is what we're seeing, in, for example, in Transmission Gully, where a construction contractor signed up to, where actually uh, the owner of the contract, in this case the government, loses total control of the price of it uh, because of the nature of the contracting, the ability to ramp up cost for unplanned and unforeseen uh, aspects of it. Um, it. It could be corrupt, but it is certainly, uh, I, I think, an unaccountable form of contract. Thanks for that. Shall we applaud them? <laughs> makes a nice transition as we move on. And the next question is about the media, so I guess I should really don sackcloth and ashes to ask it, but I'm scared they get in my mouth. Um, we know that the media were already facing a systemic crisis before COVID. Um, their financial model, based on selling advertising, 
uh, has been pillaged by social media. So the clouds were already gathering. Then COVID comes along and the crisis becomes existential. Um, the listener disappears, although it's back now, thank God. Um, it looked for a while as though the, the stuff stable might follow it. NZME uh, has balance sheet issues. So two related questions. You're just in time. Two, two related questions on the media. How important is freedom of the press um, in strengthening public transparency and accountability, number one? Number two, what needs to be done to strengthen the media's own integrity systems so they can be effective in preventing corruption and perhaps also in keeping them on the straight and narrow. Fletcher, I'll start with you. So in terms of policy, New Zealand first um, is... Uh, as frustrated as uh, the Right Honourable Winston Peters gets with the media, and it happens every day, um, we are strong advocates of the Fourth Estate and their role in our democratic uh, process. They, they must be there, and, and we cannot let that lapse. And in fact, unfortunately, this government had to uh, invest, was it $50, $50 million in the media uh, bailout package uh, earlier this year, and, and that was about ensuring that that um, stable of uh, media outlets uh, could continue. Um, there's there's some, probably some fair arguments around their own uh, principles and, and ethics. Um, I, would, I would debate uh, with some of them on those um, issues, but it doesn't, for example, you talk to a reporter just like they talk to a politician, there's usually a mutual respect. It seems to change as you go into the editor's office or something like that. And that might be about uh, competition and and who is shaping the message, um, who, who has that privilege. And there's not a lot of competition in New Zealand anymore, and that's something that we need to be mindful of as we um, proceed forward in terms of making sure that we have a sound fourth estate to hold um, us accountable. But you're right in terms of the phrasing of your last question. Is there or what can we do um, as a public as, as, a, um, as a country to ensure that um, the media themselves are, uh, excuse me, are held to a standard also. So, I mean, in order to get or sustain that sort of competition, um, would you go as far as to... I'll finish the question and let you answer it briefly, right? It's, Beginning to sound like the chase. Um, <laughs> would you would you go so far as to direct public funding towards commercial organisations? Well, we kind of do it. That's been on the agenda. We kind of do it with RNZ, right? One of the big um, budget items of the last budget was uh, increasing funding to RNZ. Uh, we uh, were government when that decision was made, and they certainly haven't been uh, particularly friendly to us. <laughs> but, 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 they're, but they're publicly owned. That's true. But perhaps the step I would take, and this is a personal opinion, is more about um, the accountability of social media in our, our modern discourse. Uh, because not only are they sapping uh, revenue from these kind of traditional outlets, but there doesn't seem to be the level of accountability uh, that we, I, I believe we, in this room we would all would want in, in terms of um, what we're seeing uh, in these um, social media um, platforms. Uh, I think that's an opportunity. James, what would you be doing to... Um strengthen the media's own integrity systems, such as they are, um, so that they can be more effective uh, in the business of attacking, dealing to, and exposing corruption. 
Well, I, I, do, I do think that funding and financing is critical to the health of the system, uh, and it's clearly taken an absolute hammering um, over, the re over the last decade, um, and, and that is accelerating uh, at the moment. Um, and so I do think that um, public financing of, uh, shall I say, non-public media uh, entities um, is probably the only sustainable um, way forward in a economy as small as New Zealand's. Um, in an ideal world, uh, I think you would have a colossal um, endowment fund um, where, because the, the risk, of course, of public funding is that um, either economic circumstances or a hostile government comes in and cuts the funding. Um, and, and so it still becomes beholden to uh, the political paymasters. So I think if you were able to, you would have a, an entirely separate uh, fund that had nothing to do with government that was large enough to be able to make um, allocation decisions. I do. Um, I don't. I, I, I get uncomfortable with the idea that we should be using public money to fund for-profit entities. But if you look at the recent developments with stuff, for example, where Sinead Boucher bought stuff for a dollar uh, from um, um, Fairfax, uh, then you've got essentially a um, you know a worker cooperative model. You know, um, where you, which is a non-profit entity, uh, where you could say actually there is a case there for um, funding that. I mean, that's a that's not like RNZ or TVNZ. It's not owned by the government. It's an it is a separate entity, but it doesn't have that profit motive uh, at play. Um, and and so there's that. And then the, and then the other thing is actually is just things like the um, press complaints um, process and so on. Again, that's a pretty anemically resourced. Um, thing and and I think those kinds of processes uh, where you can take a complaint and have it heard um, is a good way of keeping accountability in in the system as well. Um, but like Fletcher, we have to do something about social media because regardless of funding and financing, it's a cancer in the system. Andrew, just your general take on the importance of the freedom of media and whether their own integrity systems are strong enough to be able to kind of sustain the battle against corruption, which has always been part of the media's business. Yeah, I, there's no question. Um, a strong, robust media is absolutely vital for a thriving uh, liberal democracy such as we've got. And I actually think, too, look, we, we all have good days and bad days, and so does the media, but we are pretty well served by our media in New Zealand, both um, uh, privately owned and public media, and we should be very thankful for that. Um, but I think because of uh, threats around funding and finance, uh, some of that is at risk, some ethical standards are at risk. Uh, to the extent that we regard uh, the role of the media in informing people in holding those in power to account, both public and private, um, and there is a public interest in that, then I think there is a case for public funding to media organisations. We do it, with the state-owned organisations, Radio New Zealand, to some extent TVNZ. Um, we do it with private organisations like MediaWorks through New Zealand On Air, uh, but, and we do it for entertainment purposes and some documentaries. But actually for our day-to-day our -day current affairs, um, I don't have a problem with there being some uh, state support for that to ensure integrity of reporting, uh, good uh, journalistic ethic, ethical standards being maintained um, is going to be vital. You know, the, the counter to the abuse of power is there are those who are able to call it out and not be uh, themselves compromised for doing so. That's why an independent media is vital. I just want to say too, if you have a look at the respective performances of the the publicly owned media and the privately owned media, actually our private media does a pretty darn good job. You look at the work, for example, that Michael Mora did on the border control issues we had during the, the pandemic, he didn't win a lot of popular press from a lot of people kind of on my side of politics, but he did a darn good job. You have a look at the, the first two leaders' debates, TVNZ and MediaWorks, I know which one I prefer to watch, uh, that I found much more informative and, and I think, you know, well, well moderated, and, and it wasn't TVNZ. So which one was it? <laughs> David, do, do you share um, Andrew's sense that in order to 
deal to what is a kind of existential threat uh, that commercial media are facing at the moment, that there is a justification for trying to sustain them better with public, public funding? Well, I think the key, we found out a lot more about the COVID response and some of the, the deficiencies and some of the things that were actually going on because of what the media were doing. So I think that's a key part of the accountability system. The one that I worry about most is that old-style journalists that I've known for a long time who've come up under a completely different system that was economic and you had real quality in there. And, and a lot of those are still hanging on, but they're not there for that much longer. <laughs> And you're not, you're not getting the training ground for their replacements. So my suggestion for what it's worth, this is certainly not National Party policy, would be let's get some of the money off the social media guys, which we a number of countries in the world are into. We are expanding our tax net. If they're going to take advertising money from here, then let's get some of that money. We do fund films that are not for profit. I can't see why we shouldn't have an agency like a film commission style thing that funds investigative journalism. I certainly wouldn't want it funded from central government where the money's being controlled by the people that it's designed to be policed. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, Je Jessica, do we need to do more um, to make it easier to encourage the media more to discharge their task of holding power to account? Yes, absolutely. And I'm probably going to have to go after this question. I'm very sorry, but I have a, a, a meet the candidates at 7.30. But um, on that, absolutely. So, so um, TOPS policy is that uh, we should be, as David said, we should be taxing the likes of Google and Facebook, and that should be used for a public interest journalism fund, a contestable fund that, that public or, or um, that, that RNZ or, or private companies can, um, can apply to. But I think I would go... Further than that, because one of the things that motivates the media to um, hold parliament, uh, to hold politicians to account, is an informed, um, sort of an independently informed public. So I feel like civics education is a massive part of the story. I've taken it upon myself to make a whole bunch of sort of videos and things about how um, how MMP works, because it's always shocking how many people. Um, I meet who don't know there's an election, don't understand that it's for central government, don't know the difference between what central and local government does, don't know what their two votes do, don't know whether, you know, which vote is more important for what reasons. And because the, um, the media, you know, relies on, on readers and, and, and clicks and they don't always like pu the public service, they've got the speed, the, the sort of the speed transparency uh, trade-off as well, if they are reporting to an informed public, um, they are going to have, I think, a, a, a stronger ability and incentive to report on really important things that are happening in politics. We don't have time for applause, unfortunately, so we'll <laughs> move on, straight on. <laughs> well, if you must. <laughs> Final question, and because we're running short of time, and as I said earlier, it's important that these guys have their opportunity as well. I'm almost going to ask you not only to give a very brief answer, but almost a yes or no. And since it's about political party funding, I don't think you'll have any difficulty with that at all. Um, what we know is that three political parties had or have cases in front of the serious fraud office around what may be illegal party donations. All three of those parties are represented here tonight. And I should make it clear that none of the legal processes underway are concluded yet, so it's much too early uh, to be pointing fingers. But the optics of having three of our major parties implicated in this sort of stuff are awful. Bearing in mind that parties aren't viable without funding from somewhere, do we need to change the way we fund political parties? 
And do we need to change the political funding rules? And we'll let them follow it up. So don't, I don't need a least early stage of Who am I going to start with? Can I start and then I might have to... Yeah, 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 that's, sure. Yep, yep. That's okay. Yes, so um, at top we support a Royal Commission into funding of... Um, political parties. I should note that in 2019, TOP had more donations than all the parties in Parliament put together, and the average donation was $25. So you can fund a political party on micro donations, but we support a Royal Commission, and we really would like it to look at um, uh, vehicles like democracy dollars, for instance. James? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. <laughs> David? I think the answer to that is probably no can to their yes, but maybe I can explain a little. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think you've got to get the transparency rules to work because we do want transparency about who's donating what. And if you're not, if they're not, and one question will be are people understanding them? Uh, because we've got these cases, so what went wrong? Are these examples of the system working <laughs> because they got found out, or are they examples of the system not working? <laughs> so not sure about the answer to that and probably not the place we should go. We do, if we do not want foreign donations, in my view, uh, certainly from foreign governments, question about if we've got an Australian parent of a New Zealand sub, should a New Zealand sub be able to contribute? Well, possibly. Uh, and our party is built on engagement with members, uh, and that is a key cornerstone of, of the building of it, and they give things to the party by way of time and, on occasion, money as well. So, Thank you. Fletcher. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to see taxpayers funding parties' political campaigns. Um, uh, and, and there's kind of two reasons for that. It's kind of, well, you don't want to lock in those political parties who are already kind of popular in power. You want to encourage participation from outside, you know, the mainstream. So to do that, you have to um, get donations. Uh, there's been a lot of um, politicians say the system's kind of right. It's just that accountability, that transparency and holding um, political parties to account. And there are three parties here who are being held to account. So um, let's go through that system and learn from mistakes. Andrew. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if we're not going to uh, get contributions from uh, you know, voters, or for that matter, you know, corporate interests, then it's got to come from somewhere else than the other, other place the public discourse really points to is state, so state funding of political parties. Other countries have it. We don't have a tradition of that. We've relied on um, on private uh, voluntary donations. Um, uh, Jessica's not quite right when she says that TOP was funded by a whole bunch of small donations because, of course, they had Gareth Morgan, um, who provided not a small amount of seed funding, let's face it. Uh, and we had a number of political parties that have had huge benefit, or benefactors with huge resources to set political parties up. Ironically, seldom ever getting elected, and um, we've had the you know, um, various incarnations of um, Christian parties and what have you. But, but this is the de debate we've got to have. If we're going to flip from and, and, and want to mitigate the risk of people donating, particularly significant do donations for improper motives, then state funding is the alternative but we'd have to have a reasonably extended public debate about that, something we haven't had up to now. Thank you very much. Turn. Yep, 100%. So, yes, questions. And we've got some microphone runners who will bring the microphone to you, and then we'll be able to go have something to eat afterwards. You have to talk. You have to talk a little bit before it turns on. Kia ora koutou, Felicity Wong from Historic Places Wellington. Um, you mentioned social media, and um, 
the question is not so much about financial integrity, but more about integrity of the political discourse or the debate about various policies. So I would ask um, Minister Little for his views on this in light of the campaign being run by Neil Jones from your office some time ago um, to be involved in um, the consultation by the Wellington City Council on the draft spatial plan. He's been running a campaign on Twitter and um, heritage people like myself have been accused on Twitter of being in favour of homelessness by Neil <laughs> and spin-off writers. Um, and what, what is your advice to us about having a good discourse about something that's really important for our city when you have politically inspired uh, PR companies involved on Twitter? Thank you. I'm not quite sure what Neil Jones's personal interest or stake in it is, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with him leading or running a campaign. I've seen a number of comments from a number of people on Twitter about, about that. It tells you there is a set of political differences over that. There are some people who are in favour of uh, high-density high, high density housing. Uh, some people will say that is the future direction of metropolitan areas like Wellington. There are those who say we want to preserve um, the way things look now, uh, because they are historical and have some value. Um, that is a legitimate political debate to have. I don't think there's any scope for anybody to take offence about there being a difference of view about that. Uh, we have a major challenge about housing, how are we going to accommodate people, and, um, and that is a part of it. Um, it. It doesn't surprise me that there will be some sort of campaign. There typically are when important uh, public decisions are made, in this case by a city council, the planning decision, because it will affect a lot of lives, both now and in the future, and we should welcome and cherish the public debate. Cool, thank you. And take a question from the other side now. All right, no one over there has any questions. Um, hand up over here. Was there? Yep. Thank you. Yes, Liz Holbro. Um, I've been worried for some time about the future of investigative journalism, as I know several of you have, and I was quite surprised when both Stuff and Spinoff invited voluntary contributions, because I thought that really can't get them very far, can it? But leaving in the cause, I made fairly small, modest donations to both of those, and I've since had feedback from both of them saying that it really did make a difference, that they were able not just to retain staff who had been doing investigative journalism, but in both cases they'd appointed extra people whom they named. Staff went even further by inviting a selection of the people who'd made donations of that sort to a function where they had presentations from their leading journalists, uh, with Sinead Boucher there as well, who even confessed that the dollar was a bit misleading. There'd actually been a lot of uh, asset negotiation involved. But still, she'd done it very cleverly, and I think what Andrew said about the basis of it was totally correct. And uh, if you didn't believe her, you had the opportunity to question it. Uh, and uh, there was a very uh, lively exchange between journalists and those present, which was then followed by the sort of interaction we'll have in a few minutes. So uh, I just wonder uh, how, whether that's sustainable and whether that can be a part of the future. I, I wouldn't like to think that it would stop government considering whether they dobbed in as well, and it might even help the government to dob in if that movement becomes more pronounced. So I'd just like to commend it to people here tonight who are interested in investigative journalism uh, and uh, watch what the companies say, because what they're saying at the moment is that it's important to us, it's made a difference, and it's given us a source of feedback about what we're doing. And I really think that's very healthy, because some of us are a bit concerned at the way journalists behave at times, and if you have a chance to have them on about it, then uh, who knows, uh, that can make a change as well. Can we get a comment from all of the... Um the people up here on the on the podium, um, just because this is a model that exists in other places. I mean, public radio and television in the U.S. 
are, to a very considerable extent, funded by um, subscription or by local ballot or by telethon. Is there any reason why we shouldn't kind of widen the stream of funding and go after this um, much more purposefully? Mayor? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, stuff at least, I think, have taken a leaf out of The Guardian's book and because The Guardian went down that route of asking for voluntary con contributions. Of course, The Guardian is supplementing an enormous... Uh, fund that they happen to have, which enables them to be able to do what they're doing, um, and they take advertising as well. So they're looking at, you know, they're, but they're basically pulling every lever that they're able to uh, able to pull. Um, I think. So, so do I think it's sustainable? I don't think it's sustainable by itself, uh, and um, and but as but as a way of receiving revenue, uh, I don't, th uh, you know, I don't have anything against it. Um, but I think it, I don't think that we should rely on that as the future of journalism. Um, and I think probably our media uh, industry made an error of judgment some time ago, and the window of opportunity is now closed for everyone to adopt a subscription model. However, in a country of five million people, a subscription model isn't going to be enough. The New York Times has been very successful with its subscription model, but they have 40 million readers. Um, we only have five million people, most of whom don't punt for newspapers. So, um, so you've got to look at something else, uh, which is why I was talking before about the idea of saying that we've got to underpin it with some form of public funding that somehow doesn't have anything to do with politicians. David. Yeah, I like it as a great model. I mean, the other thing, isn't it, how much more engaged do you feel to stuff, having gone along, had the discussions, felt that what you'd done was valued, and uh, had an engagement with them other than purely reading the paper? I think I'd pay my 800 for the digital version, and then I find out that if I was more tech-savvy, I could find a way to get it for free. So I feel like I'm already implementing your practice. <laughs> Thank you. Fletcher. I'm going to say something controversial here tonight and um, say I completely agree with James Shaw. <laughs> Mark that down. <laughs> we do have a record. Yeah, exactly. There's reporters in the room. Um, yeah, I think, look, as, as others have said, other, other news outlets have followed that model. Guardian is the other one too. But like the New York Times, they have a worldwide subscriber base, not five million people. The other thing is too, we do have news outlets... Um, who do have uh, significant benefactors who have allowed them to establish. Newsroom is one of them. They do good quality journalism. Um, they're, not, they're not entirely reliant on subscribers. They do get contributions and subscriptions, but they have significant benefactors sitting behind them as well. Um, and that's only one step removed from, you know, for example, uh, you know, corporate sponsorship. And there's always going to be that 10... Not that corporate sponsorship and media have ever been... Uh, um, allergic to each other, it's been critical to it. But uh, when it comes to transparency and integrity and openness in the media, we need to know, you know where the significant sources of funding are coming from as well, uh, particularly uh, given that it's no longer just advertisers anymore. Thank goodness that this isn't a Zoom conference and we have actually been able to go over time. But I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it now um, because um, we've taken uh, everyone's time beyond what they'd originally committed to. But can I please um, thank our speakers tonight, um, our, our four political can candidates, Tamitha and Ian. Can you join me in thanking them? Um, <laughs> And I want to thank all of you for coming and for your excellent questions. Um, it's really appreciated. And I don't know how you felt, but it was not only was it a pleasure to be here in person and not to be on Zoom, but what is, wasn't it a pleasure to hear people answer questions honestly and without posturing tonight? Um, I think we got some real genuine answers. And, um, 
this is a special place that we live in. Um, and, um, you know, through deliberate steps that we take now, based on what we've done with COVID, where we've shown how we can work as a trusted democracy, we have real opportunities, I think, for business recovery that's going to make a difference, that's actually going to bring us up higher than we've been in the past. Um, and you see tonight that we've got evidence that the solid foundations of transparency and accountability are with us. We've got some great people running for parliament, and let's look to what they do when they get there. Thank you all. Please stay after. Go upstairs and have some refreshments. Thank you very much, Karen and Blake and Georgia and Alexandra, for actually working on this, and Karen for co-hosting with Transparency International. Um, we'd like you all to become members of Transparency International, or at least join our database. These discussions are so important to our future. Thank you very much. See you upstairs for refreshments.